The SWIG program in Jewish Studies and Social Justice of the University of San Francisco acknowledges our presence on the unceded land of the indigenous Ohlone communities and pays our respects to these traditional caretakers and elders, past, present, and emerging. It is our intention that this acknowledgement plays a role, however infinitesimal, in a much larger process of confronting the past in order to create a not yet realized future rooted in justice. Welcome everyone. I'm gonna stay down here. Welcome everyone to the University of San Francisco SWIG program in Jewish Studies and Social Justice's second annual Alvin H. Baum Jr. Memorial Lecture. <laughs> where in memory and honor of Al Baum and Cheryl Lazar, we annually honor an LGBTQ plus Jewish social justice activist. My name is Camille Angel, and it's my honor and privilege to serve as the first rabbi in residence at USF and to teach in the SWIG program in Jewish studies and social justice. And I'm Aaron Hahn Tapper. I direct the SWIG program in Jewish Studies and Social Justice and get to work with Rabbi Angel, Orrin Kroll Zeldin, and a bunch of other magnificent people. Before introducing tonight's event, let us tell you a little bit about the University of San Francisco, USF, as well as our extraordinary Jewish Studies and Social Justice program. Founded in 1855, USF is the city of San Francisco's first university a premier Jesuit Catholic school. In 1977, we became the first Catholic institution in the world to endow a Jewish studies program. Some 30 years later, in 2008, we became the first university of any kind, Catholic and otherwise, to have an academic program formally linking Jewish studies and social justice. And in 2019, we added yet another first to our renowned history by forming a new position on campus, that of rabbi in residence. I imagine you'll agree, there's never been a better time in history to serve as the first lesbian rabbi in residence at a Catholic university. I teach two classes, Queering Religion and Honoring Our LGBTQIA Plus Religious Elders. I have the divine work of supporting queer folk on their queer journeys and Jews on their Jewish journeys and, well, frankly, everyone else because everyone needs a rabbi, so consider me yours. <laughs> and consider yourself invited to our interfaith Passover Seder in two weeks, Tuesday, April 11th at 6.30 p.m. This year, we're using an anti-racism Haggadah and we're gonna go deep. It will be led by my students, our resident minister, Glendy Alvarez, and my new wonderful colleague in university ministry, the Reverend Dr. Ronnie Sims. As trailblazers in formally linking Jewish studies with social justice, we're excited to announce today that for the first time, we're launching a new program that expands our student communities. This August, we're la launching our first graduate level certificate program in JEDI. That's Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion and JSSJ. <laughs> JEDI plus JSSJ. This program will allow professionals to power their careers with the tools to implement systemic change around anti-oppression, social justice, and human rights in professional contexts learning from experienced and renowned educators and change makers. These certificate holder, holders will emerge as real Jedi masters. Hold for applause. Oh. <laughs> On Jewish studies and social justice, systemically infused with Jedi values, developed to train professionals to work within, between, and beyond Jewish identified communities. The official announcement about our new certificate program is forthcoming, and we would appreciate your support in helping us get the word out to the community. Your support advances our growth in an effort to make a real difference. Through the SWIG JSSJ program, we believe that education is the best way to make long-term systemic change. 
Whether one has the time to take a semester-long course or a mere few hours to hear from a single speaker, education is fundamental to making our world better, paramount in shining the spotlight on the margins, on oppressed communities who are mistreated merely because of their race, ethnicity, religion, gender, sexual orientation, or another social identity altogether. USF is a remarkable place. Our tagline, Change the World from Here, is the real deal. With approximately 10,000 undergraduate and graduate students, US News and World Report reports that we are the number one most diverse campus in the country in terms of racial and ethnic makeup. An educational institution where a third of our undergraduates are the first in their families to attend college, we estimate that 10% of our student body identify as Jewish and more than 25% identify as queer. Two years ago, USF made the wise choice of bringing Provost Chinre Opara to be our provost and to lead and inspire us to curate for us a transformative educational set of opportunities. She is doing so with integrity and eloquence and birthing justice in this crisscross paths of this diverse universe we call U U USF. Please welcome Provost Chinere Opara to the podium. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rabbi Camille. What beautiful words. Thank you so much, Professor Tapper. Um, what an incredible evening. Just look around for a moment. This is an incredible space. We are coming together at the intersections of social justice struggles. The Jewish pro the SWIC program in Jewish studies and social justice really helps us to think about the ways in which faith intersects with race and class and gender and genocide, colonization, indigeneity, immigrant status, all the ways in which we hold these multiplicity of identities. Here at the University of San Francisco, we are a beloved community of educators and learners who are coming together in this context of a faith that does justice to seek to be people with and for others. And so we think about the ways in which we are with you and with ourselves. It was hard, harder some years ago to be able to be authentically who you are in this kind of a space. Um, today we're going to hear about and hear from some of those trailblazers who opened up doors so that others of us could come through and stand in our own authentic, authentic selves. For myself, um, I think about what would it have been like to come here at a time as a provost, as a black female provost, as a first black female queer provost at a Jesuit university, to be here 30 years ago would have been unimaginable. And yet, the building blocks were put in place by some of the people that we hear about and hear from today. We're here in a lecture series that honors Al or Alvin Baum, who was an incredible change maker here in the city of San Francisco and also somebody who was deeply beloved. He was somebody who opened up doors, who looked at the work that people could do at the grassroots and thought about ways in which, and practice ways of supporting and funding that work. He opened up doors and he built around him a community that continues into today and has made this series, this lecture series, a legacy of his work. We're also gonna to hear today from another first, the first gay, outward, outwardly gay state senator, Mark Leno, who is here with us tonight. We're so excited. How courageous, how courageous to stand boldly and authentically and say, yes, I am something that actually in this country for centuries has been despised, and yet I am proud, and I can stand here, and I can let you know, the next generation, right, our students who are coming forward, just be yourselves. It's going to be okay. So this is an incredible, incredible space. I think about that timeline uh, that was shown on the screen earlier, and I think about the ways in which we're going to be adding to that timeline. Well, we can already put on there, we have Rabbi Kumil, the first uh, uh, lesbian Jewish uh, rabbi here at uh, the University of San Francisco, so we can add to the timeline 2021. I think I'm going to put myself on there. <laughs> um, but our students are going to be adding to this timeline. That's what makes me the most excited, and I'm so excited that so many of them are here tonight. So we're grateful for you, for your presence, for your ongoing support, 
this work couldn't happen without you, all the myriad ways uh, that you do this work, uh, for those who lift up um, and support our students and our faculty and our staff here every day. We're so grateful for their efforts. Um, so tonight, I want you to really lean in, really listen, not only for the incredible stories that you're gonna hear today, but for the ways in which people demonstrated incredible courage and the ways in which that inspires you to just think about what could you do a little bit more because of what you've heard tonight? What are you inspired? What do you feel empowered to do because of what you've heard tonight? Because that's what this gathering is about. This is about Jewish studies and social justice. That means it's about a call to action. And we're all called tonight to listen deeply to what our most authentic self is telling us that we need to do to make the world a better place. So welcome and thank you. So welcome everyone to the second annual Albaum Junior Memorial Lecture honoring lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and intersex Jewish social justice activism. To those of you who are here in the room and to those of you who are joining us virtually on the live stream, we are so glad that you made this evening your priority. This is the second in a series of five lectures made possible by the family and friends of Albaum as a celebration of Al's life and his contributions to pursuing justice and equality for LGBTQIA people. It's a Jewish custom that at the anniversary of a dear one's death, you study something relevant to that person. You bring their spirit alive and kindle their legacy. And Tuesday marks the second anniversary of Al's death. So it's most appropriate that we gather uh, today to honor his memory, and learn something in his honor. Al was warm-hearted, gifted, and a devoted community leader, well-educated with several degrees. Al had careers as a lawyer, an urban planner, a social worker, and a therapist. He was instrumental in founding the New Israel Fund, the Gay and Lesbian Task Force of the Jewish Community Federation of San Francisco, and he served on countless boards and committees including the American Civil Liberties Union and the Lambda Legal Defense Education Fund. In 2013, he was honored as the Lifetime Achievement Grand Marshal of the 43rd Annual San Francisco Pride Parade. Not only did he do good deeds in abundance, but Al also made, motivated others to follow suit. Al became my friend over 20 years ago. It was a joy to see him make a life with his husband, Robert Holgate, I had the honor of officiating at their wedding, one of the happiest days in, in Al's life, in both of your lives. I also had the sacred privilege of helping Al reach his final days on this earth. The many community members who are joining this, us this evening in person and by live stream are here because of their abiding affection for Al and for you, Robert, and for Pam and for Cheryl Lazar. May their memories be for a blessing. Al was born in Chicago in 1930. The world in which he grew up was very different than today. People and institutions were unkind to gays and lesbians and gender nonconformants, to put it mildly. In fact, Al remained closeted and conflicted well into his adulthood, and it was only in his 50s that he began to live an integrated life as an out and proud gay Jewish man. Once he was out, he made up for the lost years by seeing to it that others would have an easier time and by making sure that boardrooms and committees in the Jewish community were welcoming places for LGBTQ people to be of service and to hold leadership positions. He was often the first gay person to participate in various groups, but he saw to it that he wouldn't be the last. As a young lesbian rabbi, I met Al in 2000 when I became the spiritual leader of the flagship LGBTQ synagogue here in San Francisco, Congregation Sha'ar Zahav. I didn't meet him at prayer services. He'd be the first to tell you that he wasn't the religious sort of Jew. 
Rather, I met him as the most generous philanthropist to causes near and dear to our communities. In a moment, I'm going to share with you a four minute clip from a much longer interview taken by Mason Funk, who's here with his husband up from LA tonight, who has created an amazing archives called the Outwards Project. And you will get to meet Al yourself, but before that, let me take another minute or two to share with you the objective of this lecture series. For most of history, and still in many places, even here in San Francisco, being gay or lesbian, bisexual and transgender, non-binary and gender non-conforming has been deemed unnatural, immoral, and or criminal. The Abrahamic faith traditions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, are largely to blame. Religious teachers, preachers, and parishioners have cherry-picked biblical scriptural verses to create a false myth of God versus gay. But God versus gay isn't just a false dichotomy. It's a rebellion against the image of God itself. This is among the most pervasive and hurtful untruths in America and around the globe today. And people all across the ideological spectrum continue to believe it. Religious-based hatred for gays and lesbians, transgender and gender non-conforming people is a historic injustice that continues to wreak emotional and spiritual havoc on people of all ages. Having worked in LGBTQ religious communities for more than two decades, I've met thousands of people wounded by what they see as a conflict between religion and LGBTQ identity. It's unsurprising that many queer identified people have given up on religion. Religion gave up on them first. In the classroom, I hear the stories of our students who have been made to feel less than fully human. Young people consider suicide as a means to escape the pain and shame which religious authorities, teachers, parents, texts, dogma, doctrines, politicians, priests, and rabbis spew, preach, legislate, and dictate in order to destroy lives. For too many centuries, we've let this We've, we've done, we haven't done enough about it. And here we are chipping away and making quite, quite a difference. In my own life, I've had to carefully navigate into seminary by getting around instruments meant to weed out homosexuals, to witnessing day schools and summer camps trying to do the same. And now again, we are under attack, most notably in Texas and Florida. Students tell me that if their parents were to find out that they are taking classes that honor LGBTQ elders, their financial support would be taken away. Students during COVID were Zooming in from their literal closets, afraid of being caught listening to our class discussions. When prospective students and families see the rainbow flag in the window of my university ministry office, when queer people see USF marching in the pride parade, when we make religious support for LGBTQIA people fully visible and explicit, it matters. For some, it's life affirming, and for others, it's life saving. I am grateful beyond words to Aaron Han Tapper, director of the SWIG program in Jewish Studies and Social Justice, for making my work at USF possible and enabling me to do my part in countering religious based homophobia and transphobia. Tonight's program is just one example. And of course, it takes a village to make this repair work real. I want to acknowledge by name just a few people. First and foremost, Al's husband, Robert Holgate. You are a good, kind, and generous man. Thank you for your faith in me and for supporting my work as a rabbi in residence and for making this series possible. Pam David. You've become a mentor, a lifelong friend, and part of my family. Your years of brilliant strategic direction in politics and philanthropy have shaped our country's landscape in countless ways. And Cheryl Lazar had the very best of you. To the co-hosts, benefactors, and friends, more than 100 individuals and organizations that are listed in our program, may you be fruitful and multiply in your efforts to repair the world. And thank you to our JSSJ Assistant Director, Orrin Kroll Zeldin, the staff at USF, especially Victoria Farlow, our JSSJ Program Assistant, the Office of Development, and the Office of Communications. 
Thank you to President Fitzgerald, Provost Apara, and my colleagues at University Ministry, including our director, Angelica Quinones, and our university chaplain, who's here with us this evening, Donald Godfrey. Thank you for supporting this body of sacred work. Thanks also go to the elders in our community, Jay Cohen, Lisa Scher, Joss Eldridge, and Sandra Marilyn, Kathleen Archambeau, Sam Dennison, Pam David, Dr. Marcy Edelman, Mark Leno, Charlie Spiegel, and Mike Striver. Mike Shriver. You are a striver, though. <laughs> if you are an LGBTQ elder and here with us tonight, will you rise as you're able so we can honor you and applaud you if you're here as a... As a And a special thanks to Mason Funk. Thank you for um, your archival work with Outwards, which enables us to hear a few words from our, bene our benefactor from on high, Al Baum. <laughs> I came out as a gay man in 1975. Before that, I had some girlfriends. It wasn't obvious, it wasn't uh, easy, it wasn't, uh, it didn't fit me, but that's what I did. I thought that's what I had to do. Well, I was very closeted. I would go to the parks and pick up somebody and have sex, but I, I, I never told them my name, or if I did, I gave them a fake name. In 1972, Jim Foster was the first out gay man to address the Democratic political convention. That was a turning point in this country. He was a friend of mine, and that changed me. And then I decided I really needed to do something about this, and I started going to therapy. And then I had a friend who was one of a group of 10 men who started something called Lavender University. They were all gay. And I had a friend at that time who was a, the, the education reporter for the Chronicle. And I asked him if he would be willing to do an article. He said, of course. So I made a plan to bring two of the 10 men to him. And uh, I was gonna introduce them in that league. But what happened was only one of them showed up. And he said, well, Al, stay, don't, don't go. I, I, I need some more quotes. And then he said, your quotes are really good. I want to quote you in the, in the article. Would that be all right? And I can remember, you know, they say when you're drowning, your whole life passes before your eyes. Well, it was like that. But I had been telling people, friends, that they should come out. And I said to myself, you have to be willing to do it yourself or, you, or you're just being hypocritical. And two weeks later, there was a story in the newspaper with a picture of me and a story that made it very plain that I had a personal interest in this Lavender University. And that was it. I smile always still when I use that word, philanthropy, because I refuse the label for years and years and years and years. To be honest, long after I had the wherewithal to give more than most people can, uh, I didn't. And I finally got into it because I was shamed into it by a Catholic friend of mine, who, a gay Catholic friend of mine who was a lawyer, and we became quite close friends. He had the mentality or the philosophy of a priest, which was do, do for others. Patrick said, you can do it, just do it. You know, there's so many good causes around and you know some of them already, but just give a little more. He worked on me and worked on me and worked on me and gradually, 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 I started giving more. Doing that has become part of my life. Being the age that I am and having had the health issues that I've had, uh, I, I've had to think about what happens when I die. You can't take it with you. So I used to say I was a bad Jew. And then people, rabbis and other people would say, you do so much else for, for, for the world and for people who don't. 
and that's true. That is part of the Jewish religion, that tzedakah. And I do do that. I admit that. <laughs> um, it doesn't feel spiritual to me, but I think it, in terms of what people mean by the word, perhaps it is. Now, before I introduce Mayor Art Agnos, who will introduce tonight's esteemed guests, let me explain how the evening will unfold from here. Mayor Art will introduce Mark. Mark will speak until approximately 7.35, and then his students will screen their legacy video, and we will have some time for Q&A. And finally, we'll hear from Robert and Pam. I want to say a few personal words about my social justice hero, Mark, before I hand it over to you, Mayor Art. As you will learn, Mark has devoted his life's work and resources to improving our society at large, as well as our LGBT community in particular. People of all ages and life stages have been positively impacted by Mark's governance. Among my favorite pieces of legislation that Mark authored in 2011 is the Fair, Accurate, Inclusive, and Respectful Education Act, also known as the Fair Education Act, Senate Bill 48, and informally described by media outlets as the LGBT History Bill. Quick poll to those of you who went to public schools here in California. How many of you were in classrooms where LGBTQ history was taught? Raise your hand. Well, let's start with this. How many of you went to public schools in California for high school? Raise your hand. Look around. Now, of those of you who went to public high schools, how many of you had LGBTQ history or teachers who talked about their own history in the classroom, in the curriculum, in the textbooks? So imagine the trickle down takes a while because it's on the books to make it happen. And, and it's because of Mark Leno. This California law ensures, this is your words, Mark, that the historical contributions of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people and people with disabilities are accurately and fairly portrayed in instructional materials educational textbooks, and the social studies curricula by adding LGBT people to the existing list of underrepresented cultural and ethnic groups already included in the state's inclusionary education requirements. Here at USF, we bring to life this anti-oppressive pedagogy, which insists on enabling us to see ourselves represented in all our rainbow beauty. My students can attest to the difference it makes to learn queer history from those who, people who made it. Last semester, Mark was a teaching elder in our honoring our LGBTQIA plus religious elders CEL, Community Engaged Learning Course. He was paired with three students with whom he met every week for 14 weeks and taught them about LGBTQ history and community, Jewish values and social justice. Mark's service is exemplary. As history will be told, he will be remembered for having made this great city and state a truly more righteous place. And now, the honor of introducing you, Mayor Art. Art Agno served as San Francisco's 39th mayor from 1988 to 1992. While he was mayor, he established policies to open access for middle-income families, communities of color, and the LGBTQ community. He's been a longtime friend and ally to Jews and many of our concerns. Art, you mentioned how this feels like a homecoming, as you've known everyone here at USF, including our original benefactor, Mel Swig. Mayor Agnos was asked by California State Assembly and Leo T. McCarthy to join his staff in January 1968. McCarthy was elected Speaker of the Assembly in 74, and Art became his Chief of Staff. During this period, 
Agnos helped obtain the first California state funding for community-based mental health services, serving the, L the lesbian and gay community, helped pass nursing home reform, and worked for the preservation of farmland. Agnos also authored, authored laws that provide support for family caregivers, fair child support payments with a calculation that remains known as the Agnos calculator, safeguards against brain damage in the boxing ring, and legislation to ban discrimination based on sexual orientation. It's my distinct privilege to welcome the Honorable Art Agnos, who will introduce this year's guest speaker. Can we move that down? Yeah. As I said in the other room, I am taking a good look at all of you because it's been a long time since I've had a chance to talk to an audience this big. Uh, at 85, not too many people are interested in what I've got to say about current events, but I have a few and I want to share them with you. Uh, by the way, this is a first for me because I've never given a speech or an introduction, which is going to wind up a little like a speech, <laughs> to an audience that wasn't alive when I was mayor. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> so I'll get used to it, and I hope you will too, but. Um, I am absolutely delighted because, as uh, Rabbi Angel said, I have old relationships with the older people here. <laughs> and I feel like it's a homecoming because I know them all so well, and I'll talk a little bit about my number one guy, but uh, it is a special privilege because Mel Swig was a dear friend of mine, uh, an advisor, and uh, supported me throughout my career and was someone I could go to to understand this city when I had trouble with that. He was a mentor, he was a philanthropist, he was everything, and uh, I, gotta, I gotta say, a important member of his family, his sister-in-law, Sissy Swig, is here, and I just want to give her a shout out to Sissy Swig. I salute the University of San Francisco for its extraordinary commitment to this series and the Mel Swig uh, Jewish Studies and Justice Program. As you heard, it's the first in the country in 1977 to create that program. And even more phenomenally, this university created in some 42 years later, the rabbi in residence program. You young guys and gals ought to be very proud of your college, of your university. And you ought to brag about it everywhere you go to what a progressive university ought to be. They've got some issues, but they are the best. <laughs> they got the best. So uh, I was delighted to have a chance to introduce my buddy, Mark Leno, and I was on my way over here, uh, and uh, I wasn't sure, so I was where I was going because that of the, some of the new f facilities that have been created for these kinds of events, and I wasn't paying attention to where I was going, and I went through a stop sign. I slowed down, but I didn't stop. <laughs> now, the cops are supposed to be, as we read the paper, all downtown watching Union Street and working at Tenderloin and much more important issues. But I look in the back of my, my rearview mirror, and the red light is on. And it's a San Francisco police officer stopping me and says, can I have your license and registration? I was hoping because he was sort of middle-aged, maybe. 
Maybe. No luck, he starts writing. So I thought I'd give him a hint. Because I really don't like to just say, do you know who I am? I mean, that's not my style. So I said, you know, I had lunch with Willie Brown last week. <laughs> Kept writing. <laughs> and next week, I'm hoping to see Speaker Emeritus Pelosi at an event. Kept on writing. <laughs> and finally, he said, I said, I'm going to speak tonight for a very important San Franciscan, former Senator Mark Leno. By that time, he finished writing the ticket. And he says, you know, Mr. Agnos, you seem to know a lot of important people in this city. <laughs> but you really ought to get to know Ed Hawkins. Ed Hawkins? Who's he? He says, that's me. And he walked away. <laughs> Anyone who has paid any attention to community life in our beloved city of San Francisco or our state of California, or for that matter, this country has felt the impact of Mark Leno's work. He is the son, grandson, of Russian Jewish immigrants who was born and raised in a loving family in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. After high school, he entered the University of Colorado. He didn't do so well there, which was remarkable. But he left after a year. He didn't really connect to it. And moved to Jerusalem, where he entered the American College in Jerusalem. And he was a star as the valedictorian of his class and got his BA there. From there, he spent a couple of years in rabbinical studies at Hebrew Union College in New York before he decided to move to San Francisco at the suggestion of his beloved sister. The freedom of San Francisco was a game changer for a young man who had come out at the age of 18 at a time when being gay was a crime and considered a mental disorder. It was not as easy for, Mike, for Mark. His religious beliefs and prayer sustained him strengthened. And it was a very simple prayer. He showed me, taught, taught, told me, I am made according to thy will. That simple is what gave him that kind of strength. And that journey led him to volunteer to help those with no voice even before he was elected. But for four, 18 years as a member of the Board of Supervisors here in San Francisco, the State Assembly, the State Senate, he stood up for those with no voice. He always said that his 100% his work was driven by economic and social justice. He, mar he often explains his commitment. He probably will tonight. I can honestly tell you that my commitment emanates from my Jewish background and the philosophy of tikkun molam. I say it right, Mark? <laughs> Means repair of the world. What a magnificent phrase. Repair of the world. However, he did not repair anything for people he helped. He did it with them so that they could be empowered as they moved through their lives. And it was not restricted to his own immediate gay constituency. It was for everyone who needed him, sometimes even his critics, because he's the kind of person who did not hold those kinds of prejudices against people who had prejudice against him. Listen to a few highlights from his work. California Universal Health Care Act, Airline Passenger Bill of Rights, Fair education to include, as you heard, LGBT and disabled people in social science history curriculums. Harvey Milk Day in California, making it the first one in the country. Digital privacy rights of California citizens. Increase the state's minimum wage. Limit and restrict the use of solitary confinement in juvenile facilities. Addition of electronics, electronic cigarettes to the state's existing smoke-free laws pushing for solar panels on public infrastructure, requiring cities to re include walking and bicycling in their general plans for development, 
Clean Money and Fair Elections Act to bring public financing to political campaigns. And that's just a sampling of what this man did. Look at the awards that recognized that work. And this is only a partial list. The American Heart Association, Parents and Friends and Lesbians of Gays, American Foundation for AIDS Research, Lesbian and Gay Lawyers of LA, California Attorneys for Criminal Justice, Kamala Harris Leadership Award, Consumer Attorneys of California, Electronic Frontier Association, Northern California Innocence Project, Mental Health Association of San Francisco, and that's just a partial list. A smattering of the work that he has done to live up to his religious tradition that has inspired and motivated him. Tikkun Olam, repair the world. It's a wonderful concept. It's one that I'm going to keep with me the rest of my life. He had a very special, Mark had a very special relationship with Al Baum. Throughout his career, Al was Mark's sounding board, his wise counsel, and major supporter. He often referred to Al as a Renaissance man for all the things that Al did in human rights, the environment, gay rights, Jewish community, arts community, city planning, and philanthropy. My friends, I'm here to say to you tonight, so is Mark Leno. He is also a Renaissance man, and I can hardly wait to hear from him. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our speaker tonight, Mark Leno. That was great art, it, if long. <laughs> you gave half my presentation. We're running 20 minutes late already and I haven't started. So I hope you'll bear with me as I adjust what I'll be able to say in my limited time. Uh, and any number of names have already been mentioned by the rabbi, but I have a desire to restate uh, in terms of my thanks and appreciation to the University of San Francisco, to President Fitzgerald, to our provost who's so articulate and magnificent, thank you, and to Aaron Han Tapper for supporting the rabbi in the remarkable work she does. And Rabbi Angel, we're, we're friends, we're old buddies, but to work with you in this capacity here in your program I hope everyone understands, and I know the students do, and what an honor it was to have a number of you as my students this past year. Uh, you're changing lives. You, these are classes that you will remember for the rest of your life. I went through university. I don't remember that many classes. Yours, you will remember. Uh, to see a number of these uh, legacy videos that the class members were assigned to make of their teaching elder, uh, when they were presented, the students were in tears. It was that emotional for them. One young lesbian who had come out to her family and was told that, well, if you proceed in your life as such, expect to live alone, to be lonely. You'll never have love. You'll never have a relationship. But this young woman's teaching elder was Pam David. And Pam shared with her class her love for her recently deceased Cheryl Lazar. And for the first time, this young lesbian realized her parents were wrong and she could have love in her life. And she wanted to be like Pam David. That's what you're doing here, opening hearts and minds. It's astounding. And so we are all so indebted to you. Uh, Sissy Swig, thank you for being here tonight. This is such an honor. It really is. So uh, it's an honor to be following Marcy Edelman 
as the second honoree to speak at this Al Baum Memorial Lecture Series. And Al, of course, was a dear friend and a teacher and a mentor to me, and you've heard a lot about him tonight. And uh, we all miss him greatly, but what a legacy le he leaves in the hands of Robert Holgate, who is taking it all to next levels. So thank you, Robert. Uh, I was to talk about my life, which Art has already done for me. Uh, and so you've saved me some time, uh, because there are other things I want to talk about as well. But if there is a theme to it, and I know I'm speaking to many people here tonight, but mostly it's a presentation to the students that as challenging and as dark as these days can appear, uh, and I won't have to list the litany of things that are staring planet Earth in the face right now and some of the ugly and hateful politics that are coming out of one of our political parties, and excuse me if I get partisan, but that's who I am. I'm a partisan Democrat. Uh, <laughs> but I want to tell you, there's reason for hope, real reason for hope. And Harvey Milk spoke a lot about hope. Among his quotes was that hope is the ability to see that there is light despite all of the darkness. So that's what we want to pierce through tonight. As Art mentioned, I was uh, born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, grandson of Russian immigrants. Uh, and I don't have a lot of drama or heartache to share about how difficult growing up was because I came from a loving family. Wonderful parents, two beautiful, exquisite sisters, Janet and Jamie, with whom I'm best friends to this day, and so fortunate to have them in my life. Uh, so left Milwaukee to go off to University of Colorado and uh, subsequently back to the University of Wisconsin and then my last three semesters at the American College in Jerusalem. And then off to rabbinical school. Uh, with a mandatory first year program in Jerusalem before going back to New York. And in my second year of what is a five year graduate program, I figured out that wasn't going to be my life's path. And so I am a rabbinic dropout. Uh, <laughs> and moved to San Francisco. Within a year, I started a business, a sign company, which I still have today, 45 years later. And it gives me some street cred to say I'm a small business owner, and, and, and I love the business very much. Uh, and something my father told me, he was also entrepreneurial and was a business owner and a businessman himself. He said, one of the joys of being in business for yourself is you never know who's going to walk through your door tomorrow. And sure enough, on May 20th of 1980, a young man named Douglas Jackson walked in my door, and there is such a thing as love at first sight. <laughs> and we had 10 remarkable years together before he died of AIDS in 1990. And yes, that is traumatic, and uh, the epidemic was devastating in ways that words can't describe, and I know many people here tonight have uh, lived through that with me. Our community suffered greatly, and we learned from all of that. I want to talk about uh, four prayers that have stayed with me from my rabbinical days. And my students know about these prayers. I've shared them, and Art shared one of the four. Uh, but I'm going to go into them just briefly, uh, because I want to talk a little bit about uh, a couple pieces of my legislation that I think are appropriate and meaningful to the program we're here tonight uh, to honor. Uh, four prayers that are, I guess you could call them mantras, um, and if you ask me what do I believe prayer is and who's listening to prayers and what power or meaning they have, I can't know that. 
None of us can know that. But I can tell you, it keeps me mentally and spiritually on track every day throughout the day. So these just keep going through my head, and I hope you'll understand them as I describe them. So without getting too pedantic, uh, Hebrew prayers all have a prefix. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam. That's the first part, just about all prayers in uh, the Hebrew tradition. Translation being, blessed are you, creator of the universe. And then the prayer continues. So the first one is, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam. Uh, the meat of it is, Shehecheyanu Vekiyamanu Vehigiyanu Lazman Hazeh. And that translation is, who has given us life and sustained us and brought us to this time, this place. So it is a prayer of gratitude and a reminder from where we've come and where we are and has meaning just at any moment of any day, good or bad moments. Uh, take note that it's an uncommon prayer because it is declined in the first person plural, which means who has given us life and sustained us and brought us to this time and place. So it speaks of community. It's not about me. It's about us. Thank you, Creator, for giving us all of this. So there's also that wealth and warmth of recognizing that we are all bound together. A prayer of gratitude. And when you think about it, you can't do better with grat than gratitude, because if you are, if we are, appreciative of all that has been given to us, and if you start to list it, it's astounding, and how quickly it can be taken away in any second. So it's all very precious stuff. Thank you. Second prayer is same prefix. Uh, the rest being shehakol nehiyeb bidvaro according to who, whose word all things will be. Well, that's a curious prayer. Uh, what about self-determination? Don't we have any choices? It's really all determined by this creator that we struggle to understand. Uh, but that's our paradox as human beings, isn't it? Yes, we do get to make choices. And as uh, the next generation coming into adulthood, it's important that wise choices are made, life-sustaining choices, good habits, life-sustaining habits. Uh, everything's a habit in life. Is it a life-sustaining habit or a habit that's going to drag us down and interfere with what we want to do and where we want to go? Uh, but at the same time, you just have to look at the earthquakes and the floods and the fires and the drought and all the possibilities that are beyond our control in many ways. So there is this paradox, but that's a part of our existence. The third prayer, and this is the one that Art had touched on. I'm going to digress just a moment because, Art, I didn't thank you appropriately, uh, not only for the introduction, but for being you and for your great leadership uh, to our city. Uh, what an extraordinary mayor Art Agnos was, an extraordinary man he continues to be, and even more than that, uh, and greater than that, is his friendship, uh, for which I'm appreciative. Uh, a rare man. Thank you very much. So this third prayer, uh, blessed are you, creator of the universe, who has made me according to thy will. Now, there are historical reasons which I won't go into, which many of the rabbis in the room understand. Uh, but for me, as a young man who came out at age 18 in 1969, yes, I define myself as a stonewall baby, that prayer meant a lot. Because as we know, more so over 50 years ago, but certainly still today, and I won't mention their names because they're not worthy of hearing out loud, uh, but the messages were so negative from government and from elected officials and from our churches and synagogues, from our teachers, from our families, our elders. It was all negative. Big mistake. 
as if we had a choice and that it's all wrong in every sense of the word. And to, to read in a book, a prayer book, who has made me according to thy will. No mistake here. I'm the way I'm supposed to be. That meant everything to me as an 18-year-old, and it means everything to me as a 71-year-old. I remind myself multiple times during the day, one of my four prayers. And the last one is a good bookend to the first because it's also a prayer of gratitude. And that translates to, blessed are you creator of the universe who has provided for me all of my needs. Sha'asali kol ki, all of my needs. A prayer of gratitude, but think of it. And I have to remind myself after I say it to myself, are those just words that you really believe that, Leno? Because if I do, Think of what that means, that whatever I'm facing in my day, whatever's challenging in my life, I'm not lacking. I've got it within me. It has been provided by this creator. All of my needs have been provided, so it's there. But think also that we live in this consumer capitalistic society Every message we get from the marketplace, all the advertising, every billboard, every television commercial is telling us we're lacking something and you need to buy this so you're no longer lacking it. We're too tall, we're too short, we're too thin, we're too fat, we're too young, we're too old. Our teeth aren't wide enough and we've got bad breath. It just goes on and on. And those are negative messages, but that's how they sell things. So to remind myself, again, that it's all been provided sufficiently. If I really believe that, well, that every day is just pure joy and bow down and say thank you once again. So there are a couple of, well, I've got a, preface the legislation, people ask me, how'd you become a state senator? Small business owner, state senator, how did you, how'd, you, how'd that happen? So just brief story, uh, it really all has to do with fundraising. You may not see the connection, uh, but that's, uh, as my business began to grow by the mid-1980s and I was able to get out of my office, I somewhat naturally gravitated to volunteer and get involved in community service. Of course, it was the height of the epidemic. There was no shortage of work to be done. And I found a very dangerous thing about myself, that I had a facility for fundraising. Dangerous because then everyone wants you on their board of directors <laughs> because no one likes to raise the money. I did. And you might wonder, what was that about? Where did that come from? I have a very clear memory, more than a clear memory, a visceral memory of being in the fourth grade Hebrew class, 10 years old, and every year of Hebrew class, four years prior to the bar mitzvah in eighth grade, around this time of year, right before Passover, we had a contest. Which student could sell the most kosher Bartlett's chocolate candy? <laughs> And the winner of the contest won a transistor Magnavox radio, the height of technology of the day. And it even had an earplug extension, which meant I had this little piece of technology that I could sneak into my bed and listen to the Milwaukee Braves baseball game when I was supposed to be asleep. So I was motivated to win this contest. So most of my classmates sold a box to the house on the left and a box to the house on the right and called it a day. And my father, as I told you, being entrepreneurial, said, no. You take out the congregational directory and you start at A and you finish at Z. <laughs> and you can imagine how charmed these congregants were that Manny and Esther Leno's son just called us to buy some chocolate candy. 
and he's in a contest. So, of course, we want to help him out. And I'd say, could you buy a box or two? Every once in a while, the response would be saying, Mark, I'll take 10 boxes. Oh, such a sweet feeling of validation and vindication. <laughs> and that leap forward to the Magnavox radio. Well, I won, of course. <laughs> but jump forward to 1985 when I'm selling tickets to the Human Rights Campaign dinner or to the AIDS Foundation dinner, and I'm selling tables and tickets, and when someone said, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take five, it was the same feeling. <laughs> the exact, and it, I loved it. And so I just enjoyed it all so very much. Someone once said, Leno, you are, I'll, yeah, yeah, I'll take your dinner ticket. You are such a salesman, you could sell anything to anybody. Well, I took it as a compliment, but I thought, well, if that's the case, why am I selling signs? Uh, so that's, I have a sign company, which has provided me a great life in San Francisco, a really great life. It sustained me and allows me to be here today. But I've never been passionate about signs. What I get passionate about is ideas. And if you were to ask me to define the job of a legislator, legislators are salespeople of ideas. Imagine me just pushing a cart down the street with ideas. Who will take my idea? Two for one today. <laughs> we say, literally. Anyone who's got an idea and can put it into legal form, sometimes you get it from the yeah, newspaper, sometimes I dream it up myself, sometimes Art remembers all this. He was an assemblyman, a very accomplished one. And sometimes uh, community groups, activists bring you ideas. And if you can put it into legal form and you think it's got a chance of getting through the legislature and you can sell it to a majority of your colleagues, that idea becomes law. And it's very thrilling experience and a very gratifying experience. And it allows one the opportunity to tikkun olam, to the repair of the world. So I raised money for Tim Wolford when he was running for the school board. I raised money for friends who were running for public office. I raised money for ballot measures. And I raised some money for Willie Brown's first mayoral campaign in 1995, which brought me to his attention because if Willie pays attention to anything, it's money. <laughs> and so there was a vacancy on the county board in 1998, and he offered me the appointment. And so that's how I got into public office very fortunate, through the back door. It was not on my to-do list in life. I never would have run for office. So it's as we say in the Jewish tradition, it was beshert that I would suddenly be an elected official, a public official. And I was very ambivalent at first. Uh, I didn't know that I could keep my business going, putting 80 hours a week in the city hall, a job that paid $30,000 a year. I had a couple of mortgages. I couldn't afford to lose my business. I would have sunk completely. I'd never done any public policy before. I just knew how to raise money. And I didn't know that I'd be any good at it. I didn't want to fall on my face in a public fashion. Uh, so there was good reason to be ambivalent. But in short order, uh, I realized that I was a closet policy wonk. I loved public policy, I still do to this day, and that I was pretty good at it. And soon that ambivalence became an ambition. And there was an open seat in the State Assembly in 2002, and I ran for it, and I won. And so then I had the good fortune of serving six years in the State Assembly, and then at the end of that period, there was an opportunity to run for the State Senate and then I had eight more years in Sacramento. So 14 years, I loved every minute of it. It was a privilege, it was an honor. I want to encourage any of you who are even considering community or public service to consider elected office because we need caring, intelligent, well-informed, well-educated folks doing these jobs. We see the kind of 
people who are getting into the House of Representatives these days, and it's kind of scary. So uh, we need you. We need you very much. So that's how I got into public office and got to Sacramento. Uh, the two bills, and I know we're running out of time already. Uh, I don't know how much I'll be afforded, but I'll try and get through this. Uh, before I got to Sacramento in 1999, uh, I was able to author a piece of local legislation. And isn't it interesting that a little something never done before anywhere in the United States that we did in San Francisco, just impacting San Francisco, a local ordinance, had great ramifications. What the ordinance did and does is provides equal access to our county health plan for county transgender employees. All the health plans excluded any transgender health care. That's just the way it was, both for public institutions and private health plans. And working with a transgender civil rights implementation task force, which my office assembled, their top priority looking at all of the hardships of the transgender community in terms of access to education, to housing, to employment, to health care. They chose this health care issue as the number one priority, and that's why we move forward with it. So it was about accessing health care. We had 17 transgender uh, employees at the time. So it was a minimal universe. But uh, every headline screamed, San Francisco to pay for sex change operations. And as a result of it, I got a call from Bill O'Reilly at Fox, uh, would I come on his show? Now, many of you won't know who he is because he was fired for sexual improprieties and tens of millions of dollars that uh, Fox had to pay because of the things that he did. But he was yesterday's uh, Tucker Carlson. So you have a sense of how he operated. So I was on his show, and of course, the first thing out of his mouth, bellicose as could be, supervisor. Why should my tax dollars go to pay for someone's sex change operation? I said, well, Bill, that's not exactly what we're doing. Let me explain. If you're a non-transgender employee of the city and county of San Francisco, and you're in need of hormonal treatment or psychiatric treatment, you need a mastectomy or a hysterectomy, the county health plan pays for all of it. But if you're a transgender employee in need of the identical medical care, the plan pays for none of it. And when I finished, Bill O'Reilly said, Supervisor, you make a compelling argument. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, that's a victory. <laughs> so a few years later, when I got to Sacramento, my first year in 2003, uh, thanks to arts leadership going back to 1977 as an assemblyman, one year after California's legislature and governor repealed the felony definition of adult consensual same gender relations, it was a felony. California finally repealed that. Well, once that was done, Art introduced a bill, AB1, to add sexual orientation to our Fair Employment and Housing Act, FIHA, which prohibits discrimination on race, creed, color, nation of origin, origin language as you speak, is a long list. Art <coughs> attempted to add sexual orientation, 1977. <laughs> and I don't know all the history of all the votes, but it, got reintroduced every year because it wasn't getting signed into law. AB1, AB101, AB1, it went on for years. It took 22 years after 1977 to get it signed into law in 1999, but we hadn't and, uh, added gender identity. And so I had the honor of introducing that bill in 2003. It had been authored by another colleague of mine, Jackie Goldberg from Los Angeles, a year before, that was the first attempt, and it wasn't managed well, and it got labeled the drag queen bill. So disrespectful, because uh, we all understand there are differences. And uh, 
So I tried again, and we were able to get it passed. And Gray Davis was in the midst of a recall and looking for friends that October when he was signing bills. And I don't know if he would have signed it otherwise, but he signed it into law. Thank you, Gray Davis. Uh, but that year, uh, as every year in the assembly, there's a floor ceremony. Every member of the assembly is allowed to bring a woman from his or her district to honor woman of the year. And given that I had a close friendship with a woman named Teresa Sparks, a transgender woman, who worked with us on our transgender civil rights implementation task force, I asked Teresa if she would receive the honor of being our woman of the year. And so she came to Sacramento, and I specifically walked her up and down the aisle of uh, the assembly floor to shake the hands of every one of my colleagues because they didn't, they'd never met a transgender woman before. And I wanted to put a face to the bill so they knew we were talking about a human being, many human beings, and why we needed to protect them from discrimination in housing, employment, and public services. So Teresa accepted, and we did that, and uh, we got it signed into law. So I don't know if there's, <laughs> I guess I, how much time do I have, Rabbi? One minute. One minute. <laughs> so uh, I won't have time to be able to share with you uh, the wonderful stories that uh, made up our effort first of its kind in the nation, to provide equal marriage rights. Oh, you have two <laughs> 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 Through the legis pro legislative process. So you, most of you know, uh, because it was a current history, uh, that it finally became law of the land uh, through court cases, and finally the Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court. But we were able to get it uh, to the governor's desk first in 2005 and then in 2007. Arnold Schwarzenegger vetoed it in 2005. We garnered even more uh, legislative support in 2007 and got it to his desk a second time. Uh, keep in mind that as he was denying us the ability to take marriage vows with the individual that we loved, he was screwing around with the housekeeper under his wife's roof and impregnating his wife and his housekeeper simultaneously and had two children at the same time. Uh, that's when Maria left him, and good for you, Maria. Uh, <laughs> uh, but no other state had done that. It would have changed the course of history. We don't have time to get into that. Uh, I think I've probably gone on long enough. It's been a great honor. Again, uh, just to end on the quote of uh, Harvey Milk, uh, hope will never remain silent. And it is your voice and our voices that will keep that hope alive. Hold on to it tightly. It's everything. Thank you very much. So this is Norman. He was one of my three students this past year. I'll let him introduce himself. Yes. All right. So hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Um, so my name is Norman Fang, and my pronouns are he, him, his. I am a senior nursing major here at the University of San Francisco. It is such a great honor standing in front of such a big audience to be able to present the legacy project that, I, that was created to honor Mark Leno, his life, and his work. Thanks to Rabbi Camille Angel and her class honoring our LGBTQIA plus religious elders, um, the class that I took last semester. Josue, Alyssa, and I were able to meet such an amazing person and learn about how much he has impacted and improved the situation for all LGBTQIA plus identifying individuals within California. I cannot express how appreciative I am to share this legacy video with all of you. And without further ado, here it is, and I hope you all enjoy it.
Okay, uh, and I'm Mark. Hello. Good to meet you all. So, Throughout the semester, we had the great privilege of learning more about Mark Leno's life, journey, and accomplishments. Through this legacy video, we hope to highlight these accomplishments and our appreciation for everything he has done to better the climate for the LGBTQIA community in California. Without further ado, we present you with the life and legacy of Mark Leno. Chapter 1, Early Life and Upbringing I was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It's a city of just under a million people, so population-wise, about the size of San Francisco, but a very different kind of city. The uh, population was made up of a lot of German immigrants, a lot of Polish immigrants, and my family was part of a large Russian-Jewish wave of immigration. So my parents were born there. My two sisters and I were born there mid-century, and I was blessed with a really great childhood, loving parents, uh, good public schools, all the things that count. Chapter 2, Coming Out and Coming to Terms In terms of Mark Leno's experience with coming out, he describes himself as a Stonewall baby as he came out as gay in 1969 when he was just 18 years old. This was a difficult time for him as many people in his hometown, school, and family had no idea what it meant to be gay since it was such a foreign concept. This was the case when he experienced homophobia during high school and when his father did not understand or support him when he first came out. However, Mark and his father reconciled years later and he became a loving supporter. Besides this, he was still able to receive support throughout his early life from his mother, siblings, and different friends, including JP, Gary, and Chucky, known as the Radical Queens, back at the University of Wisconsin. Lastly, staying true to his roots in Reformed Judaism, Mark came to terms with his sexuality through Hebrew prayers, including, Blessed are you, creator of the universe, who has made me according to thy will. This allowed him to be unapologetically himself. And I remember that prayer in particular, as I was coming out, when there were so many negative voices in my head and surrounding me at every turn, that there's a Hebrew prayer that says specifically, I am made according to thy will. There's no mistake here. This is who I am and how I'm supposed to be. Chapter 3, Undergraduate Education I was not all that focused on my undergraduate studies, but I had great experiences. I, I spent my first year in college at the University of Colorado in Boulder. My sophomore year, I spent at the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee, and I went to the American College in Jerusalem, which was, it's no longer operating. It's a, it was a small private college in Jerusalem, Israel. So I finished my last three semesters in Jerusalem, I did find a major, finally, psychology. Chapter 4, Postgraduate Education I decided I wanted to continue postgraduate studies in a rabbinic program in New York City. It was of Reform Judaism, which is how I was raised and my parents. I entered into the Hebrew Union College first year program as a rabbinical student. It was a five year postgraduate program. And within a few months I realized mm, this isn't working for me. And so I dropped out, I'm a rabbinic dropout. And... Chapter five, revivification in San Francisco. 1977, uh, I had a sister at Stanford at the time. And I remember she had written me this letter that said, get out of that cold, dirty city come to California and revivify. That's the word she used, not a word you hear very often. And I moved to San Francisco, February of 77. And within a year, I invested a relatively small amount of money to open a sign company called Budget Signs.
Chapter 6, Douglas Jackson. In the spring of 1980, a young man walked into my sign shop and we became life partners for 10 years. His name was Douglas Jackson, most beautiful man in the world. And we really hit it off. And Doug worked with me in the business uh, from 1985 until he died of AIDS in 1990. I've been a single man since. Chapter 7, Ambivalence Turned to Ambition As a person who engaged in a lot of volunteer work and community service for LGBTQIA plus organizations, democratic organizations, and different nonprofits, Mark discovered his natural talent for fundraising, which allowed him to form many connections within the political world. Specifically, he got involved with local ballot measures and fundraising for political figures that were important to him. Eventually, to start his political journey, in 1998, he was offered and accepted a spot on the County Board of Supervisors by Mayor Brown, despite feeling ambivalent about the appointment and doing this new job. This was because he had no background in public policy and he was uncertain that he could keep his business running at the same time. However, with experience, this ambivalence quickly turned into ambition as Mark continued his journey by being elected in 2002 to the California State Assembly. Eventually, he then became the first openly gay man elected to the state senate. Chapter 8. We needed to fight a war over a word. Of course, of all the hundreds and hundreds of bills and probably thousands of issues that I engaged in over the years, uh, the marriage bill was probably one of the most, if not the most exciting. Initially, on the issue of equal marriage rights, I had always wanted, first as an activist and then as an elected official, I always wanted the bottom line for myself and for my uh, community. The same rights, benefits, and privileges of marriage, along with the same obligations and responsibilities. But I didn't know that we needed to fight a war over a word. After the Knight Initiative defined marriage as only between a man and a woman in California in year 2000, and the 2003 Massachusetts court case, which stated that there was no basis for same-sex couples to be excluded from marriage through domestic partnerships and other alternatives, Mark was motivated to fight a war over a word as he believed that it was absurd to have the government determine who loves good enough for marriage license standards and who doesn't. Because of this, Mark worked with Equality California and Executive Director Jeff Coors to propose a bill that would change the definition of marriage in the Family Code. And what our bill would do would change the Family Code to read that uh, marriage is a civil contract that arises out of the relationship between two people. Non-gender specific. As Mark was ready to present the bill at the Speaker's office in February of 2004, the Winter of Love occurred in San Francisco, where Mayor Gavin Newsom began distributing marriage licenses to same-sex couples in City Hall. This was a revolutionary time, as thousands of same-sex couples received marriage licenses despite it being deemed as unconstitutional by the California Supreme Court. However, after President George Bush presented the idea of having the Constitution define marriage as only between a man and a woman during his State of the Union address in 2004, Mark continued with the bill and all of the necessary pieces to put it into action after it was postponed. However, it was vetoed twice by Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. Despite these setbacks, Mark was one of the few who paved the way towards the legalization of same-sex marriage in California. Chapter 9, FIHA and Gender Identity In 2003, Mark was inspired to amend the FIHA bill, also known as the Fair Employment and Housing Act, so that it would include the words of gender identity, which would prohibit this kind of discrimination. To provide some context, in 1999, sexual orientation was included in the bill, but half of the LGBTQIA community were left out since gender identity was not present. To advocate for this amendment, Mark invited Teresa Sparks, a proud transgender woman, to Sacramento as his Woman of the Year. 
So Teresa came to Sacramento and I specifically walked her up and down every aisle of the assembly floor. And to look into the eye of my legislative colleague. And so Teresa could offer her hand and look into the eye of that legislative colleague and say, it's a pleasure to meet you. I'm Teresa Sparks. I'm Assemblyman Leno's Woman of the Year. And it was certainly uh, an honor worthy of Teresa, but also I, it, I imagined it could have benefit for the passage of our bill adding gender identity to the Fair Employment and Housing Act. Chapter 10, Tikkun Olam. Tikkun Olam is a concept in Judaism that stands for the repair of the world. Overall, I believe that Mark Leno strongly embodies this concept as he has dedicated so much of his life towards making the world a better place for all people. Having Mark Leno as my elder was an amazing opportunity as I learned so much more about how he helped make California a better place for the LGBTQIA community. As someone who does not know much about politics, it was fascinating and inspiring to hear the behind the scenes stories about Mark's involvement and how hard he fought so that later generations could have the chance of living a more equal and fulfilling life. Despite all of the challenges that Mark has gone through throughout his entire life, I am glad to have gotten to know him as a politician, entrepreneur, and gay role model. Because of this, I thank you, Mark, for everything you have done, and I dedicate this legacy video to you. How's it going, Mark? I just wanted to say that it has been an honor to speak with you, learn about your history and your experiences in life. I truly do appreciate you being, being able to and willing to open up to us and share the many aspects of your life, um, and being able to answer all of our questions that we had as well. I personally have learned a great deal from you. This experience has been really wonderful for me. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you, Mark, for being my elder. This opportunity has been extremely helpful in further understanding topics relating to LGBTQIA plus history. I am consistently impressed by your positive attitude, dedication, compassion, and wisdom. Uh, thank you for everything you've done for the community and for me personally. You're an amazing role model. So we're out of time in terms of questions and answers this evening, but I do want to call Pam and Robert up to say a few closing words. Uh, wow. Um, this is so heartwarming, meaningful, and, you know, the, it's the second year since Al passed. And I'm just starting to really understand the depth of the loss I feel and heartbreak. Um, but I've got to tell you, what Camille put together, what Mark said, what Art said, Al would be thrilled. He would be He's dancing. dancing. He's, he would be so honored and happy that you all showed up, that this lecture series is happening in his, on his behalf. And for me, I'm completely honored and uh, humbled by the um, legacy he left me to continue in, in our name, his and mine. And I wouldn't have been able to continue without Pam's help. And I just want to thank her. Camille, thank you, honey. And Mark, that was beautiful. Thank you so much. You know, it, um, after Al died and we did a Zoom uh, funeral, Shiva, I don't remember what day it was, but I had this incredible image of Al and my wife Cheryl, who had died about eight months earlier, dancing together. And I think they both are tonight as well. Um, we do this, Robert and I do this, uh, Al, um, because Al was an example of Tikkun Olam and the way that he could as a, as a gay man of his generation. 
as a philanthropist of his generation, as a civic leader of his generation. And um, we, do it, we started this really pretty simply because of the role that the rabbi played in our lives and what, um, what she has really taught me about pastoral leadership, regardless of religion, but the importance of having this rabbi in residence program here at USF, the openness of USF uh, to house this program and hopefully continue to support it um, is so important because that, that is the future. Uh, the future is interfaith, the future is multiracial, multi-fluid, everything, <laughs> and, um, um, and it's you all. So thanks for being here. Thank you for my friends for being here and all of you. Thank you so much. This concludes our evening.